Man, I'm still recovering from that great Cernovich, Molyneux, McGinnis party last night in New York. Still got to just finish reading the New York Daily News story about there was a fight. All these Antifa people attacked this old dude at the party. Anyway, we're going to do more about that, including one tiny little glitch I had at the party with the party organizers who I consider my brothers. But, but in the meantime, you know, so I, I picked up the wa- I, I started reading my mail this morning. and I'm so glad for the Washington Post because I feel like I learned so much from the Washington Post today. They had a big article about the founder of Black Lives Matter. Her name is Patrice Kalor, something close to that. Patrice, P-A-T-R-I-S-S-E, Patrice. Anyway, uh, so the Washington Post does this huge story about Patrice. What's the headline? When they call you a terrorist, that's the name of her book. A Black Lives Matter leader details the life that turned her into an activist. So here's the gist of the book. This Patrice Coulers details her history of criminality, mental illness that turned her into a uh, uh, mentally ill, she calls herself queer, black woman, and she's all pissed off that the people who run this country, they have not turned over a large part of the responsibility for running the country to a mentally ill person with a criminal history. So she's all pissed off at that. She says it's racism. But I really got a kick out of one other thing in the book. I and mean, this is a huge story in the Washington Post. Every other, I mean, every major media outlet in the country is covering this book that just came out by the founder of Black Lives Matter. Here's my favorite part in the book. In the, in the article from the Washington Post. When celebrities are praised for imbuing pop culture with social messages, be it Beyonce's Lemonade, you guys all know that song, or Oprah Winfrey's global uh, Golden Globe speech, the work of activists themselves can often be overlooked. So then they go on to explain to us why what this woman... Patrice Colors somehow is not getting all the credit she deserves. She's not getting the attention she deserves. Uh, for example, when Jesse Williams or or, Jay, or Jesse Williams gave that speech at some BET thing, or LeBron James gave a speech somewhere else, well, the work of Con- of Colors and her co-founders went uncredited. And they gave another example where you know so. They're talking about a woman not getting enough attention who's been the feature of major news stories in every major news outlet on the planet. The idea that the founder of Black Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter is somehow they're not they don't have a high enough profile. We're all ignoring them for reasons of our own is belied by the Post's own coverage. The Post has done over 30 stories involving that woman. Just the Post. Every single NPR, NBC, ABC, all the big ones that count, Vanity Fair, Atlantic, New Yorker. Long ago, they have coronated this woman as St. Patrice. Everything she says is gospel gets published unchallenged, no matter how ridiculous it is. But even the Post, even the Post didn't have the nerve to talk about the most ridiculous thing, her new cause the new cause of Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter, their new cause, their new thing that sounds ridiculous, but all all these new things always sound ridiculous at first. She and her buddies in Black Lives Matter do not believe in prisons. They want us to imagine a world without prisons because that's how they do it in Norway. I heard this first heard this on NPR a few months ago. They actually sent a reporter to Norway and, uh, you know, they went, some person got arrested for something, right? It's like, you know, once in a lifetime thing in this village, somebody did something wrong enough to get arrested. I think they like sent him to this place. He actually lived with a family or something really crazy like that. So that's what they want to do here. You have to wonder if the people that are making these videos, these books, if they've ever heard of Richard Pryor. Remember, he did that bit where he and Gene Wilder went to a prison in Arizona to do a movie, and he was kind of down with the cause. He was ready to go in there and explain to all the black people that he's there to sympathize with them, get them out, you know, be, tell the world about their plight. Then he starts meeting some of these killers in prison. And Richard Pryor, live, sunset, live from Sunset is the name of the record. 
very famous Richard Pryor record. He talks about meeting a killer. And they go, he goes, hey, man, why'd you kill all those people in that house? The killer says, because they was home. And the end of the bit, Richard Pryor go, you know, he, this is the most heartfelt thing he ever said in his entire life. He said, thank God for prisons. And now we get the Washington Post, NPR, every other major news outlet on this planet glorifying this person. Criminal history, mental health history, a queer person. She's all pissed off. Nobody's paying attention to her. Nobody does what she wants. And now she wants, but, but they ended up doing what she wanted. Now she wants to get rid of prisons. I guess that's the penalty we now have to pay for, uh, for not paying attention to her. You know, but not everybody sticks around this country and suffers the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune that institutional white racism inflicts on black people in America all the time, everywhere that explains everything. According to Al, a recent story in Al Jazeera, uh, more and more black people are leaving the country. Here's the, I'm going to blow through a couple of paragraphs of this story. Here's the headline. Why some African-Americans are moving to Africa. I love this story. Come from Accra, Ghana. They have come from the big cities of San Francisco, Chicago, and New York. Thousands of them. And many refuse to return. A new wave of African-Americans is escaping the incessant racism and prejudice in the United States. This is Al Jazeera, published in, in, in Gutter, the country of Gutter. You remember, the country we spent blood and treasure on. Boy, it didn't take them long enough, really that long to figure out how much life, how much Americans really suck because we're always messing with black people for no reason whatsoever, forcing them to go to Africa. Back to the story. From Senegal and Ghana to the Gambia, communities are emerging, emerging in defiance of, con of conventional wisdom that Africa is a continent everyone is trying to leave. It is estimated between 3,000 and 5,000 African Americans live in Accra, the capital. They are teachers in small towns or entrepreneurs in the capital. And they say that even though living in Ghana is not always easy, they feel free and safe. She says this woman, her name is uh, Mohamedia, Mohamedia El Mahahir. She's a digital marketer from New York City. She moved to Ghana. She moved because despite her education and experience, she was always made to feel like a second-class citizen. Moving to Africa was an opportunity to fulfill her potential and avoid being targeted by racial violence. Yes, white people are always attacking black people in America. You didn't get that memo? Of course, when I heard the first part of this about she's moving, you're going to hear more of that in a minute. But remember this famous quote, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. So she's doing the old one-eyed person king in Africa. I don't even know if that's working for her down there, but let's see. Let's hear her a little bit of her story. We're going to learn a lot about that in this story. On life as a second-class citizen in the U.S., I grew up in Philadelphia and then New York. I went to Howard which is a black university. I tell people that Ghana is like Howard in real life. It felt like a microcosm of the real wor of the world. At university, they tell us the world isn't black, but there are places where this is the real world. My favorite line, ready? Ready for the favorite? This might be my favorite line of any article ever. Howard prepares you for a world where black people are in charge which is completely different experience compared to people who have gone to predominantly white experiences. Howard prepares you for a world where black people are in charge. Does anybody remember going to the Howard website or reading the Howard prospectus, learning that Howard is preparing students for a world where black people are in charge? I mean, we did a story a couple months ago about how some white girls on a, 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 on a trip to D.C., thought they would visit the campus of Howard University because they're always telling us, well, they're not really a black school. They have lots of white kids there too, and the white kids like it. These little blonde-haired girls go to, high go to have lunch in the cafeteria. They're threatened, harassed. Got out. They, they literally had to run out of the campus or they would have been beaten. And, guess, and after it happened, every single person that commented on this from Howard at that school said, what were those white kids doing there? Those white kids deserved Whatever happened, whatever was about to happen to them. 
You know, it's always good when we catch somebody telling the truth, like a H- Howard alumni, because we're not going to get that kind of truth from Howard. So even though she was unbelievably oppressed growing up a black person in America, somehow she gathered the resources when she was 15 to go to Kenya. She traveled with a group of kids. I was one of two black kids. I saw early that I could fit in. I wasn't an outsider. Suddenly it switched. I came from America where I was an outsider. But in Africa, I no, I no, I no longer felt that like that. I did graduate I did graduate school in Ghana in 2003 and went back to New York and then moved to Ghana in 2014. I'll let you contemplate the horrible oppression that allows an American to travel 6,000 miles to go to graduate school, but you can think about that later. Quote, I have no connection to Ghana. Some people in my family did tests. We found ties to Senegal and the Gambia. But I don't think you can ever figure it out. No matter where you, no matter where you were sold, or left the port, no one can be certain where you came from. Even when you live in a place like New York, as a black person, you are always an outsider. You hear stories about the richest black people like Oprah Winfrey getting shut out of a store, parentheses, not true, or Jay-Z not being allowed to buy an apartment. Yeah, Jay-Z's homeless. These things happen. It doesn't matter if you're a celebrity, you're a second-class citizen. This was the biggest issue for me. In America, you're always trying to prove yourself. I don't need to prove myself to anyone's standards here. Remember, this is a major news outlet around the world, Al Jazeera. I'm a, I'm a champion, she continues. I ran track and went to university. I like to win. So I, I refuse to be in a situation where I will never win, unquote. Translation, I refuse to be in a situation where my narcissistic personality disorder does not get does not get me the full things that I'm entitled to, even though I don't have any real accomplishments to brag about other than I'm a black person who feels victimized. Okay, I'm moving to Ghana. Quote, there are amenities that I'm used to at home in New York, like parties, open bars, and fashion. (laughs) Always comes back to the free stuff, doesn't it? So when I realized I I could do the same things in... Okay, I'm just going to read this now. Sorry. I'm here with the great Willie Shields. He's... He's not helping any. He's, he's making me say these things. I realized I could do the same things in Africa as I could back in the U.S. I was sold. That's what we call an unfortunate choice of words. She's talking about how, some, how much she liked Africa. And she says, I was sold. Anyway, there was also a big street art festival here. And that was the difference from, from, when, I, from when I came here as a student. I saw the things that I love at home. So I decided that now is the time. When Ghanaians found out, find out that I live here, they're usually confused about why I chose to live here as an American. Parenthesis, translation. Uh, yeah, most smart Ghanaian people think I'm insane because I, lo- I moved from the greatest place in the world to a third world hellhole. Back to the article. Quote, there is definitely certain access and privilege being an American here, but it's great to finally cash in on that because it doesn't mean anything in America. There are also plenty of privileged Ghanaians. If you take away race, there's a class system. But that didn't take long, did it? Head on down there, all of a sudden, now you're doing the class revolutionary thing. I think she did a documentary about a couple people that moved down there from to Ghana from America. It's called, I think she's calling it Blacksit. I actually read that five times before I figured out it really was a play on Brexit. Willie Shields is right. I'm just not that bright. Quote, in my documentary, I chose five people that I've met since I've been here, and every one of them went to a black college in the U.S. It's something that prepares you mentally to realize you aren't a second-class citizen, something that can help you make a transition to life in Africa. Translation, American black colleges in America are second-class, third-class, fourth-class institutions with Default rates on student loans that are through the roof, easily the highest of any colleges in America. Back to the article. I made Blacksit the documentary because of this wave of African-Americans moving to Africa. 
This trend started to happen around the independence of African country, but the new wave is made up of people who come to places like this. This new group has certain access in America and comes here to have that lifestyle in Africa. Unbeknown to us, we're living out the vision that Kwame Nkrumah, the revolutionary, set out for us of this country being the great gateway to Africa for the black diaspora. I don't want people to think Africa is a magical utopia. It's just that some of the things you might face in America as a black people, you won't have to suffer with those things here. You might not have electricity, but you won't get killed by the police either. This article kind of goes on and on and on and on about Africa, what a great place it is, how Americans should go there because it's the promised land. Uh, okay, so that's the fantasy. That's the bubble. Uh, here's, here's just one tiny little slice of life in Africa day to day. Yeah, this kill the white man, that's a thing in Africa. It's a thing that, however, if anybody even put one ounce of energy into trying to hide it a couple of years ago, nobody's doing that anymore. It's very fashionable. It's very chic. It's very trendy. Lots of black people get together. They do damage to somebody. Then they start screaming about killing white people. I just did a video a few weeks ago about Nelson Mandela leading a, ch leading a song about killing white people. And, 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 you know, not one in a hundred white people who saw the video knew what he was saying. They thought he was calling because because in the article it says, the article says, yeah, there's Nelson Mandela. He's calling for world peace. That's what the article says. But the words of the song that he's singing are, let's kill the white people. So that's the Washington Post. That's Al Jazeera. That's life in Africa. That's the denial, deceit, and delusion that the national media is, is inflicting on us every day. That's what we are here to expose. We're exposing the denial, deceit, and delusion behind the greatest lie of our generation, the hoax of black victimization. The victimization that allows a 15-year-old girl to travel to Africa and discover that she's just found her second home in a third world hellhole that every single person on that continent would leave if they could. Because they know that leaving Africa and going to the U.S., even that is not going to make any black kids angry. <laughs>